Hello and welcome to another edition of the Sabbath School Study Hour right here in the Granite Bay Hilltop Seventh-day Adventist Church in the greater Sacramento area of California. My name is Pastor Sean Brumman and I have the privilege of uh, teaching this week's lesson. And this week's lesson is uh, entitled, which is lesson number 11, is entitled uh, Longing After God in Zion. And uh, so I hope that you've taken a look at it over the week. If you haven't, we're glad that you're still joining us and that we can uh, continue to come together and, uh, and look at these important truths that are there. So just like every week, we won't be able to look at all the details of every single lesson, but uh, um, we're certainly gonna look at some of our very important foundational truths that this particular theme and topic brings to light. Longing for God in Zion. So make sure you get your quarterly. Most importantly, make sure you have a Bible available uh, for our study here together because of course, as every week, that is our main textbook and uh, this is not gonna be any different. Before we pray and look into our lesson, I'd like to um, take advantage of a free gift to offer that I would like to encourage you to take advantage of as well. And it's entitled uh, A Divine Design. All you have to do is dial in to 1-866-788-3966. Again, that if you're in the United States or any of its territories or in Canada. Uh, again, the number is 1-866-788-3966 and ask for offer 902. And we'll be happy to get a free copy of the, in the mail for you. If you are in the United States, uh, this is available to you. All you have to do is uh, text the code SH152 and you want to direct that to 40544. And uh, we'll be happy to get that out to you as you get that digital download link. Now, if you are outside of the USA and Canada and you're still saying, Pastor Sean, I would like to have a copy of that somehow as well. If you have internet access, all you have to do is go to the website study.aftv.org French slash SH152 and, uh, and that will also get you access to a free digital copy. So that means friends, there's nobody in the world pretty well, that doesn't have access to the free gift. So take advantage of it. If you've never studied that topic or you've never looked at this particular resource uh, to continue to improve your knowledge and education on that. Well, friends, let's pray and uh, we'll just dive right into the lesson. Uh, Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to come together here. We thank you so much for the gift of your word. We thank you for the truths and the and the liberty that comes from the truth of the gospel and uh, all the other truths that surround and extend from that gospel in your Bible. I want to pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will guide us and lead us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, we're in the very last stretch, and, um, and that is in the last stretch of the book of Psalms. We're in Psalm, or lesson number 11. Uh, we have almost wrapped up this quarter as we've looked at that very powerful, unique book that is actually a collection of songs uh, originally. And uh, even though we don't have the tunes anymore, God has given it to us that we might continue to uh, grow in our knowledge of the theology and the truths that God still wants to give to us through the words that were inspired prophetically in the book of Psalms. So... Um, it's a very important book. The lesson quarterly brings us and points us to a number of Psalms as we've been making our way through this quarter. But uh, friends, as I said at the beginning, lessons, I want to encourage you, if you haven't finished reading through the whole book of Psalms itself, separate from the quarterly, this is where you're going to be most enriched of all. And uh, so again, especially if you've never read the entire book of Psalms, go and read the book of Psalms. And uh, so I hope many of you are almost finished as we come to the end of this quarterly as you took up my challenge. This week's lesson looks at five Psalms in common uh, with one thing in common, and that is the theme or word of Zion or Mount Zion. And uh, this is a uh, very a powerful uh, topic in truth. Uh, Psalm, the five Psalms that this particular week's lesson points us to is only a sampling of many of the different Psalms. Uh, you'll find that Zion is mentioned dozens of times through, I haven't counted them, but I can think I could safely say dozens of Psalms. And so would it be helpful for us to understand what it means when the Psalmist is referring to Zion or to Mount Zion? Some of us have heard of Zionism, even as a modern term among our Jewish friends. Uh, what does that mean? Where did it come from? 
and uh, how is it relevant to me and my understanding of the scriptures? And uh, so we want to spend some time. I have a, a, a burden to share and spend some time laying that foundation so that we can find a proper understanding of the place of Zion in the Psalms that we're studying both here and in the future. So what is Mount Zion? And some of you know the answer to that. I know that more than a couple of you uh, do not know the answer to that. I had a relatively good idea of what it was, but I have to confess as I was preparing for this lesson and studying, I have been enriched and I further understand what the psalmist means when it refers to that of Zion or Mount Zion. Now, as we have on the slide here today, we have a picture of modern Israel. We have um, the Mount of Olives, of course, has a very rich history in regards to Jesus' last hours of experience as he wept over Jerusalem just before he was, uh, shortly, just a couple of days before he was arrested and crucified. And then we also have Mount Zion. And so Mount Zion is actually a literal mount. Now, we here in, in the United States would call this mountain uh, a hill. And, uh, and so if you're accustomed to the Rockies, you would never call this a mountain. But in Israel, if you've ever visited there before, except for the far north, and I forget what the name of that large mountain is, it's so high they could even ski on it with a small resort for about a month or two every year. Uh, but uh, yeah, the mountains are not of the same magnitude. Mount Zion is, as it turns out, the highest point in the city of Jerusalem. And so this is why it has received the attention that it has both by the Jewish people in ancient times as well as uh, even in the Psalms and different parts of scripture as well. So Mount Zion, how high is it, Sean? Well, it is, um, it's about 2,500 feet above sea level. Now that's not above the, the base of the city. That's above sea level, but nevertheless, it is the highest point that you can reach. So if you want to get the 360 view of modern Israel, or even ancient Israel, you'll go to the top of Mount Zion. And, uh, and so because it was the highest point, the, Jewish, uh, the Jews that were living in, in uh, Israel in their first centuries of existence in the promised land, uh, we come to uh, David's rulership, King David that is, around uh, 1000 BC, King David is um, ruling and uh, the Jewish leaders and prophets were inspired to have this highest peak, this mountain, uh, represent uh, Jerusalem, the holy capital of God's kingdom of Israel. And uh, this was the most important city in the whole nation of ancient Israel. Uh, the location, therefore, was the most important in Israel. In fact, if you look at the bigger picture of the Bible, uh, Jerusalem was intended by God to be the most important location in the entire planet. And uh, why is that? Well, this is because it was the headquarters of the nation that God intended to bring the gospel to the world. And so as it's revealed in different prophets such as Isaiah and in the Psalms itself, uh, God has always designed to bring the gospel not only to the Jewish people, but for the Jewish people to be the light on a, hit, on a hill, as Jesus later put it, that it might shine and draw and help the whole world and all nations, every nation, tribe, tongue, and people to be able to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, when David moved on and he went to rest with his fathers, um, Solomon, his son, was ordained the very next king of Israel. And, uh, and Solomon was left with a huge task, and that is to take all the materials that David had acquired during his last years as king and is in his life here on this earth. And Solomon then made those uh, materials into a grand permanent sanctuary that then became called the temple more often than not. And so even as we go through this conversation, I think it's important for us to understand that there's three terms that are synonymous in the Bible mind and in their words and writings. And that is the sanctuary. Then we also have it called a tabernacle. And then when it later became a permanent structure and not the mobile one that was originally produced by Moses and the original Israelites, we have what we call a temple. And so we have tabernacle, we have sanctuary, and we have temple. And so whenever you use those three words, they're interchangeable. And, uh, and when the sanctuary was permanently built in this permanent location that God had in mind to, for Jerusalem to be the holy city of his holy nation, uh, this then came to be called Zion. 
um, instead of the city. And, uh, and so uh, quite often, when in, at least in those generations, a Jew would refer to Zion or Mount Zion, they'd be referring to the city of Jerusalem. Why? Because not only is it the holy city, but the holy city most importantly was called holy because it contained the holy sanctuary, the holy temple of God. And, uh, and so this is where we have this application of Zion being used originally synonymously with the city of Jerusalem. And again, this is important because it represented the gospel of Christ through the symbolic religious services that surrounded the, the actual uh, uh, altar, or not the altar, but the, uh, the, the uh, sanctuary or temple itself. We have the altar of sacrifice where the animals were sacrificed, representing the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world through Jesus, the Son of God. And then later after that, that the priest would take the blood into the, most, into the holy place, the first chamber of the sanctuary. And then he, on one day, a year on the Day of Atonement, he would enter into the most holy place. And it is in the most holy place that we find the most holy Ark of God, that golden overlaid box that God had instructed the Israelites to construct. And it was made of acacia wood. It was overlaid with a thin layer of genuine gold on the mercy seat, which was the lid. You had the two cherubim angels that were were formed as statues, uh, made one with the actual lid itself, the mercy seat. And all of this represented the throne of God itself. And, um, and so this was a very sacred place. This is what made Jerusalem the holy city, was the fact that it contained the holy sanctuary. It was here that God's presence would dwell. It was here that the Israelites, particularly the leaders and the priests and such, were able to meet with God. For not only did they have the ark in the inner chamber of the most holy place, but we also have the cherubim representing the angels, the highest positioned angels in the government of God in heaven. But then the Shekinah glory, the very presence of God himself, would dwell between the cherubim above the mercy seat. And, uh, and so this made it no small place. It was the most holy room and building that you could find in all of ancient Israel. Come with me to Exodus chapter 25 and verse 21. It's there that we find a couple of very helpful verses in regards to this particular ark and inner room. It says, you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark. Again, that is the golden laid box. And in it, the ark, you shall put the testimony that I will give you. We're going to come to that later. And I will meet with you and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I have given you in commandment to the children of Israel. And so inside the most holy place was this ark. And this ark was about three and a half to four feet long. It was about two and a half feet wide or deep. And it was about two to two and a half feet high. And, uh, and again, friends, uh, we have that, that seat, that mercy seat that I talked about that was also on top. Inside, you have the Ten Commandments carved on stone. You have the, the bud of uh, Aaron's rod that had budded, uh, representing the providence of God to Israel in a supernatural God-driven way. We also have the manna in, contained in a clay jar that is a memorial of God's providence and that he really means it when he says our bread and water will always be sure if we put our faith and trust in him. And, uh, and so here we have this powerful, powerful ark with these two cherubim. And by the way, one of those cherubim was actually occupied by the enemy of God. Sadly, the enemy of mankind and all that is good and all that is true. And that is Satan himself. Satan, whose previous name in heaven used to be Lucifer, which means day star, morning star, uh, the exalted name that God had originally given to Lucifer. And uh, sadly is now Satan today. And he actually occupied one of those positions on the left or the right hand of God himself very highly established. It's very important and helpful for us to be able to look at a statement that Ezekiel under inspiration gives to us in concern to that fallen angel, that enemy of God that once was a cherub, and, uh, and how that relates to Mount Zion in, in theology, in the Bible. It says, you were once anointed, you were the anointed cherub who covers. Now remember, the two cherub covered 
at the foot of the throne of God, represented in the most holy place over the ark. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity, that is sin, was found in you. And, uh, and so God has given us a history of where Lucifer fell from and how he became Satan. What we want to pick up on here is not only the position that he held, but also the very fact that, um, that God's throne is pictured on being a, on a holy mountain. Um, and so, friends, uh, all through Scripture, Daniel chapter 2, we have the culmination of God's kingdom as Christ sets it up here one day in our future still on earth. And it says that it became a great mountain and filled the entire earth. And this rock that had struck the earth and became this great mountain was none other than Christ, cut out of the mountain without hands. And so we have that theme all the way through Scripture where we find that God's throne and government in heaven as well now also in, as we see in ancient Israel, is represented as being placed on a mountain. Well, the sanctuary is also called the Tabernacle of the Testimony. Why is it called the Tabernacle of the Testimony? Well, the Tabernacle of the Testimony, as it turns out, contains the Ark of the Testimony. And as it turns out, this is the key reason why it was uh, rightly called Mount Zion, because it reflects the highest mountain in all of Israel. But the million dollar question that we haven't clarified completely yet is, what is this testimony that makes both the city of Jerusalem in ancient times, as well as the ancient uh, earthly temple and sanctuary, as well as the most holy place, as well as the ark, so holy? Well, it's because not only do we have the presence of God there and his government and throne represented, but we also find that the testimony inside the ark is also the very, what I could say, I think we can rightly say, is the culmination of, um, of what is called Zion or Mount Zion. All right, so let's find it here in Exodus. Uh, we asked the question, what is the testimony? In Exodus 31, it says, And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And so there we have it, friends. The Bible itself is clearly telling us that the testimony is what God wrote on stone with his own fingers himself and laid inside the ark of the testimony. Thus, why the ark is called the ark of the testimony. And so what is that testimony, friends? Well, I know that 90 plus percent of you already know that because you've already read the Bible. And if, even if you haven't read the Bible, you know that the only place that God ever wrote with his own finger on two tablets of stone is none other than the Ten Commandments of God. Many of us that grew up watching that 1956 classic movie entitled The Ten Commandments that was starring Charleston Heston and some of us that have been born much later still will find it being replayed on different cable stations, online, and so on. Um, still a classic that is enjoyed at many, by many. It's, it's still being played, you know, uh, during the Easter season and weekend in particular. By the way, this is a fun fact. Charleston Heston, um, Charlton Heston, uh, when he was filming that particular classic movie, um, he and his wife had just previously to that had uh, given birth to a baby son. And so Charlton, as well as his wife, as well as the producer and director and so on, decided, you know what? Why don't we have both Hestons star in the movie playing Moses and the Ten Commandments? And so Charleston Heston uh, played, of course, the adult Moses, the grown-up Moses. His literal biological son, which is Fraser Heston, um, actually played baby Moses that was in the basket uh, found by the uh, Egyptian princess in the reeds there floating on the Nile River. So that's an interesting fun fact for you here today. All right, so we come back to the Ten Commandments. Now the Ten Commandments is the greatest perfect ethical code and of code of morality that God has ever given to mankind. It is the greatest, most important uh, gift that God has given to us next to Jesus his son, his, himself and his sacrifice and gospel to us. The Bible reveals that it is a testimony. Well, what is it a testimony to? 
Well, none other than the very character of God. When we read the testimony, we find, even as Paul later penned in the New Testament, that God cannot lie. And that to be like God means that you are always honest, that you never lie. And so God therefore put in the Ten Commandments, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. God is not a God of stealing. And so God tells us that we shall not steal. And so we find this reflection of the very character of God. It testifies to his character. It testifies to the principles of heaven. This is how heaven operates. Uh, the Ten Commandments are perfectly obeyed and followed as a principle of the heart and of the mind and of the mouth and of the hand of the action in heaven. It is also the foundation of God's government. Thus it is placed at the foot of his throne. We have the Ten Commandments placed in the Holy Ark and then we have the mercy seat, which of course we don't want to overlook there because God knows as he puts that mercy seat over it that we need mercy from God, don't we? Because you and I both have broken the Ten Commandments on different levels at different times in life. And so as we come to the very presence of God that is represented above the mercy seat, we can know that even though we have fallen short, that we have a Savior and a God that has mercy on us and that we can still approach Him and grow in the grace of God as He works in our hearts. And, uh, and so here we have God's government represented and His throne represented here um, as well. And so again, friends, I say it again. I would like to, to propose to you here today that the pinnacle of Mount Zion is that God has, uh, the pinnacle of Mount Zion is that indeed uh, the testimony reflects the very character and government of God. Very important question for us to also ask is uh, where does God uh, tell us that he wants to have the law of Mount Zion ultimately be? And so Mount Zion and what it represents is more than only the testimony of the Ten Commandments. It represents God and his throne, his government. Where does God want the law of Mount Zion to ultimately be? Well, friends, Hebrews chapter 8, many of us as Seventh-day Adventists are familiar. And if we aren't, then we should be familiar with it because this is one of the signature truths that God has given to us as a church that we're running with that no other church that I'm aware of is running to in the same uh, comprehensive and thorough manner. In verse 10, it says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them in the, on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And so again, friends, we find that God gives us a very clear and encouraging direction for us in concern to where he wants that testimony of Mount Zion to be found. And that's right here in the heart. We have, need to bring it into our mind and then we also have to allow that, 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 that knowledge of it, that education of the Ten Commandments then to make its way down into our heart. And, uh, and so God is in the business of working through us from the inside out. He doesn't want us to obey God's law from the outside in. And too many of us as religious people, including many of us as church-going Christians, have made that mistake. No, we need to get up in the morning and say, God, write your law upon my heart in a way I could never do. Help me to be able to form a character like yours, not by my strength or righteousness, not by my effort, but by your strength and your righteousness as you work through me and I work in cooperation with you as we pursue righteousness together. And, uh, and so that's the gospel, friends. And what is this telling us? It's telling us something very important that we have lost too often in modern Christianity today. And that is the gospel and salvation in Christ is not only provided to forgive and erase our sins, as liberating and as beautiful and powerful and needful as that is, but the gospel and salvation of Christ is ultimately there also to move us from sinning to obeying God's commandments, to obeying his law from the inside out. That's the gospel in its fullness, friends. Always has, always will be in the Old Testament as well as the New Covenant, by the way. And I wish I had a couple hours just to unpack that statement alone. Now, naturally, this would be much needed and necessary uh, as an element of the gospel. Why is that? Because they were not, there's not going to be any sin in heaven. Lucifer got cast out of heaven with the angels that sided with him because they were breaking God's law. And if they were cast out of the, of the heaven for breaking God's law, we are surely not going into heaven while willfully breaking God's law. And so, friends, God has called us 
to learn to surrender and allow him to work his law and his righteousness in our heart. Why? Because when we get to heaven, we're going to feel at home. Why? Because in heaven there will be no sin. There will only be perfect loyalty to always obeying God's commands and laws. And of course, that would be founded on the great Ten Commandments of God themselves. Now, this is a helpful picture of Bible truth that we can, that we, we can much better understand the Psalms of Zion, including the five that we're pointed to in particular in this week's lesson study. And so with that foundation, with that education, we find ourselves going to uh, Sunday's lesson. And on Sunday's lesson, it says, A day in your courts is better than a thousand. And it's quoting from the psalm that we're pointed to on that day, and that is Psalm um, 84. Now, let's read it together as we look at that very small psalm. It's only 12 verses long. We have it on the slides here as well. It says, How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. Now, we're talking about the tabernacle in regards to Mount Zion, aren't we? Your, your soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King of kings. And so here we have the psalmist and he's comparing uh, the, the home of these different birds to the home and the house of God, which is none other than Zion in ancient Israel, which is the holy temple and sanctuary of God. And that's why it's referring to your altars. God's altars, the altar of sacrifice, the altar of incense. It's also crying out and, uh, and, and is uh, inspiring us to reflect a living experience with God. The prophetic song, psalm here is pointing ancient Israelites as well as you and I as believers uh, to come to the courts of God in our hearts, in our mind's eye, to be able to experience a real living experience with Christ, with God as a living God, not just a theory, not just a theory and a religion on paper, but a religion and a theory that is experienced in your heart, in your mind, in your day-to-day -day experience. And that's why it says in verse 4, Blessed are those who dwell in your house. Again, that's the sanctuary, the temple. They will be praising you. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage, reflecting the Israelites by faith pilgriming to the holy city with, of course, the centerpiece of that city being the sanctuary. And as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. And there's that Zion word. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. O God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand, meaning a thousand days outside of your courts. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he behold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Friend, do you trust in Jesus? Do you trust in God? This is the, the encouragement and the direction that this psalm is, is pointing us to. Now, the original author was thinking of the temple and the ark, the ark of the testimony that was located in ancient Israel when they penned these words, the one that we find in what we call the Middle East, in modern Israel even today. And that was totally relevant in the Old Testament era. This was the place that God wanted to point Jews and the believers that became uh, believers in the God of Israel. Um, the, this is the place where God wanted them to focus on because this is where the temple was. This is where his presence was. This was the tabernacle of meeting. This was the holy city. This was where the holy sacrifices were sacrificed on the altar, pointing to the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But friends, now that we're no, long, no longer in the Old Testament era, but in the New Testament era, we come to a different place. You see, God is not so much trying to point us in this psalm anymore to that of the temple and the ark that was once located in Jerusalem in the Middle East, but rather God intends to bring us to a much bigger and better place, bigger and better things. You see, friends, this is why I am so appreciative of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, because God has led the Seventh-day Adventist Church like no other church I know 
to be able to lead us to understand that there is a sanctuary that is no longer to be looked at in the Middle East, but that is in heaven itself that the Lord himself has erected, as we found in, in great detail as a Seventh-day Adventist church in Hebrews chapter 8 and Hebrews chapter 9 in particular. Friends, God is pointing us to bigger and better things. In the New Testament era, God has called us to look to a sanctuary that is no longer on earth and never would be or should be because we are only looking to one and that is the one in heaven. That's the one where Jesus is found. That's where the one where the priesthood now is found in the New Testament era. As the quarterly points out at the very bottom of page 85 on Sunday's lesson, uh, that believers in the New Testament era are no longer called to look to that of the Jerusalem in the Middle East. Jesus and the apostles point us to a heavenly temple, point us to a heavenly Zion, as we could say. Zion as this umbrella term that was designed and evolved in the Old Testament times to represent not only Jerusalem, but also the temple. Not only the temple, but also the Ark of the Testimony. And not only the testimony, but the testimony itself, the Ten Commandments on the stones written with the finger of God. And so they appoint us, as we look at the writings of Jesus, or the, the, the teachings of Jesus and the writings of the apostles, it points us to a heavenly Zion, to a city whose builder and maker is God, to come boldly to the throne of grace in heaven, as it tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. To the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected, and not man. We look at a couple of different key verses on that. And again, we have some help for us here today on the screen. Hebrews 9 and verse 11 and 12 give us this powerful truth in its, in its summary. It says, but Christ came as high priest. We are no longer to look to an earthly priesthood. Why? Because there is a bigger and better priesthood in Christ now. With a greater and more perfect tabernacle. We no longer look to an earthly tabernacle in the Middle East. No, this was but a copy and a shadow of greater things to come, as it tells us later in the same book of Hebrews chapter 8. No, we look to a heavenly and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place. Where? Not on the not in the Middle East, but in heaven, once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And so, friends, we find here that God calls us, again, to look to a bigger and better heavenly priesthood, nothing on earth any longer. He doesn't call us to look to an earthly temple, but a heavenly temple, no longer an earthly sacrifice, but a heavenly sacrifice that took place on the cross of Calvary, but Jesus brought his resurrected, glorious body and his nail-pierced hands to heaven to be our priest today and our intercessor between God and man. Not only that, but as we come to Revelation chapter 21, it says that I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. This is not the one in the Middle East, friends. It's a New Jerusalem, a New Testament Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. For God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. What a beautiful picture that God brings to us. And then he gives us great detail in that same chapter of Revelation 21 of what we can expect as we look to the streets of gold and the mansions and the, and the pearls that make up each gate of the 12 gates that you enter into that city with. Friends, this is the Jerusalem of the New Testament. This is the Zion of the New Testament. And again, this is what I appreciate about the Seventh-day Adventist Church, is that God has helped bring that to light clearer than ever before. And we need it because there's just a whole lot of fog. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors. There's a lot of sincere Christians, friends, that we have in all different denominations and churches today. And many of them are focused still on the, the Middle East, now, if God is still just as much interested in the Jewish people of the Middle, Middle East, the Israelites, as he is in also the Palestinians and also in the Jordanians, as well as, well as the Iranians, as well as the Russians, as well as the Ukrainians, God is interested in bringing Zion to the heart and soul of every single human being that has ever lived and lives right now. God is in the God of the nations. God is the God of the nations, and he wants that gospel to be brought to every nation, tribe, and tongue, and people that they might come to know the New Testament Zion that is found in Jesus. All right, so now we come to lesson, Monday's lesson, and I might as well warn you ahead of time because we are um, 
going to run out of time before we are able to look at all this week's lessons, but I just want to lay that foundation on Zion because this is most important for understanding all of these Psalms as well as dozens of others. Monday's lesson is entitled, Pray for the Peace of um, Jerusalem. And, uh, and Psalm 122 brings up some interesting thoughts concerning Jerusalem uh, today. And the key verse of that particular psalm, we're not going to read the whole psalm here today, but verse 6 is the key one. That's the one that was brought out for the lesson title, and that is pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And, um, you know, some say that the name Jerusalem itself uh, is translated city of peace. And I think there's some very legitimate evidence for that. God surely has always intended for that city to be just that. If Jerusalem indeed does mean city of peace, and I believe it does, this is God speaking and his intentions both to the Israelites and to the world. God has always designed for, for Israel, Jerusalem, to be able to experience perfect peace. When ancient Israel was faithful to God, God is on record of protecting them. He would give peace. He would protect them from all the enemies that surrounded them because they were faithful to the covenant that God had cut with them from Moses forward, what we call now the Old Testament. But its peace was always conditional. That peace was not unconditional. Very often you'll find in the history of the centuries of ancient Israel that they did not experience peace. And that is because there was a direct correlation between their faithfulness to God's covenant, allowing him to write his law in their hearts and accept their faith and worship and loyalty from the inside out, and God protecting them. Sadly, most of their experience and most of their history is filled with unfaithfulness, and therefore they did not experience peace. That same correlation is experienced in your life and mine, is it not? Sure it is. When we look at our homes, we look at our families, we look at our local churches. When Israel was faithful to God, he gave them the fruits of the Spirit. And friends, what are the fruits of the Spirit? Some of you know them by, him, by memory. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. For the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. You see, friends, without the Holy Spirit, without a born-again spiritual rebirth and a day-by-day -day baptism of the Spirit, we cannot experience the fruits of the Spirit to the capacity, to the perfection that God wants to bring into our life. For the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, forgiveness, self-control. You know, one of the most moving scenes in Jesus' life, when he was marching into Jerusalem on a donkey, and uh, as it's recorded in Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44, we find there that as Jesus was making his way down into the holy city and approaching the holy sanctuary that contained the holy ark, that contained the holy testimony of God's holy law, we find that Jesus is approaching it on a donkey and he didn't pick a donkey by coincidence because in ancient times, and Bible times, for a king to arrive in a city on a horse meant that he was coming and declaring war. For a king to approach a city on a donkey was an unsaid way of communicating, I am a king that is approaching in peace. Jesus was approaching the city of peace as the king of peace. In fact, the Bible tells us that he is the prince of peace. And as Jesus came to the crest of the Mount of Olives and he had that bird's eye view of not only the temple and its courts, but the entire ancient city of Jerusalem. It tells us that all of the, the party that was taking place, for there was loud voices up until this point as the crowds were building and people, the Israelites were throwing their, spreading their coats on the pathway before him in honor of him and declaring that he is indeed a king that is indeed needs to be honored as such. And they were waving the palm branches and crying, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. And Jesus stops and Suddenly all the hosannas stop and the cheering and the praises and the singing stop. The waving of the palm branches stop. And Jesus begins to cry. 
I can only imagine as the Israelites were awkwardly looking at each other and expressing through unspoken expressions, you know, what is going on? Why would Jesus change such a beautiful, powerful mood like this? But Jesus, who loves Israel, who loves Jerusalem, who loves his own people as he was the ultimate Jew that ever lived, looked down upon that city. And as he saw the future of the decisions and the rebellion in their hearts, refusing to accept him with the tremendous, tremendous evidence that he had left behind him over the last three and a half years, thousands upon thousands of Israelites supernaturally healed from diseases that had been haunting them sometimes for decades, raising the dead, In Luke chapter 19, we read those heartbreaking words as he said, if you had known, even you, especially in this day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Jesus knew that their decision, not individually, because all of his original disciples and apostles, they were all Israelites, they were all Jewish, the 3,000 that were baptized on the day of Pentecost, they were all Jewish. So he's not talking to everyone, but he's talking to the nation in general and the religious and political leadership of the nation. And he knew that because they had been bucking and resisting and refusing to accept him as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, as the Messiah, the anointed one that had come to die for the sins of the world, as he looked at the future, and the destruction of that temple, and the blood that would run like rivers around the courts of that very holy place because of the rebels that rebelled against Rome some 37 years later. The very prophecy that Jesus had warned and and had reviewed with his apostles, not one stone of this temple will be laid upon another. It will be leveled to the ground and the city will be leveled. And most of the population of that city was slaughtered. And whoever survived was sold into slavery in different parts of the Roman Empire. And Jesus knew when he was weeping over that city that all of it could have been avoided if they had only lived up to the condition of the covenant that God had cut with them. Was it not Jesus that had said, you search the scriptures as he talked to the religious leaders of Israel? During his public ministries, he said, you search the scriptures and in them you think that you have eternal life. But these are they that testify of me. You see, friends, Judaism is not a separate religion from Christianity. This is one of the most common, most confusing misconceptions that we hold. Many of us, I would even dare to say most of us as Christians, do not understand. Pure, true Judaism is not a separate religion from Christianity. Judaism is the basis of which Christianity extends from. They are not two separate religions. We say there are three great religions in the world. We have Islam, we have Judaism, and we have Christianity. But the Bible doesn't teach such. The Bible teaches us that pure Judaism is found in Christianity. Why? Because Christ is the pinnacle and the climax of Judaism. Judaism was all designed to point us to the throne of God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. It was designed to point us to the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. It was designed to bring us into a living, saved relationship with the true Savior, the ultimate Jewish man, by the name of Jesus Christ. And so Christianity is the capstone. It's the capstone of Judaism. In Hebrews chapter 8, it puts it best when it says, indeed, these things in Judaism are concerned to the temple and in the Middle East, the, the priesthood, the sacrifices, all the ceremonies and feasts that surrounded it, all were copies and a shadow of heavenly things, a heavenly temple, a heavenly priesthood, a heavenly sacrifice, a heavenly city, A heavenly Zion. That's what God is pointing us to. 
This is where true Judaism is pointing us to. In John chapter 1, in verse 11, John, who was an Israelite and who was a Jew, as he sadly reflects upon the same words and the same reality that Jesus was weeping over as he looked on the city of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, it says he came to his own and his own did not receive him. Friends, I've been to modern Israel and I have to say that uh, Jerusalem was my favorite place. I was privileged to be able to see a lot of important spots in Israel that reflected both Old Testament history as well as New Testament Bible history and the ministry of Christ and the apostles. But my favorite spot was the city of Jerusalem. It's a marvelous city. It's an amazing city. It's one of the most biblically and historically enriching experiences I have ever had. I love the city of Jerusalem and I would go back in a heartbeat if I had the time and the resources to do so. By the way, the very, the very view that you see here is where Jesus wept. This is the top of the Mount of Olives. And where you see that shiny dome, this is the Muslim um, mosque, is famously known as the Dome on the Rock. And it's located exactly where the ancient holy temple of God once existed during the times of Jesus. So you can see how clear the view was for Jesus when he stood there and he wept. The stones that you see between where I'm standing and the uh, old city wall, that city wall was built about 500 years ago by our Muslim friends. And, and, uh, and, and, and no, that's not the city wall, sorry. That's actually the Temple Mount and then the city wall on, uh, connects to it on the other far sides of it surrounding the old city of Jerusalem. And uh, so as you come to the Temple Mount, or the wall of the Temple Mount, which is essentially a retaining wall that King Herod built to be able to make a huge, much larger court area around the, uh, the Temple of the Jews, um, we find there that there's all these stones, hundreds and hundreds of gravestones. That's what you're seeing, all those stones that, that, that are covering the ground that used to be um, uh, Gethsemane and uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, which was an orchard. It was an olive grove. It was an olive orchard. And uh, now it's just completely packed in with the most expensive real estate that you can bury any of your Israelite uh, relatives in. And our Jewish friends pay big money to, 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 to be buried there. Why is that, friends? Well, the guide told us is the reason is that, that they believe, as the Bible tells us in the Old Testament, that when the Messiah arrives, he will enter into the beautiful, the golden gate, which is, I think, just where my big noggin is there, uh, blocking the actual gate. And the gate is actually... It's filled in with cement because the Muslims also understood that theology of the Jews and uh, filled it in so that the Messiah would apparently not be able to enter through it. Well, Jesus did enter through that beautiful gate after he wept over Jerusalem and he continued on this journey of the donkey. He went through that beautiful gate as was prophesied that he would enter in through the eastern gate and approach his house, his father's house, the holy temple, Zion. And... Um, and so that Messiah has already arrived. And here we have all these graves full of very high-paying Jewish friends that have paid for their relatives to be buried there because they believe that they're going to have a front row view at the resurrection when the true Messiah actually arrives. And so friends, my experience in Israel was a very mixed experience. It was enriching. It was beautiful. Again, I would love to go back. I met lots of good friends, Jewish friends, Israelite friends. But friends, at the same time, my heart broke because everywhere I looked, including that massive graveyard, kept crying out, Jesus is not somebody for me. Jesus is not somebody I want in my life. Here we are 2,000 years later, and Jerusalem is no more ready to receive Jesus as the true Messiah and Son of God as they were back then. Surprising to many, as I share over the years since I've been there, it was surprising to me as well, is that the, both my observation experience as well as statistics that I've looked at since uh, tells us through research, bona fide, valid research, that at least half of all modern Israelites, Jewish Israelites in modern Israel today, don't count themselves religious at all. 
they don't count themselves as adhering to the Judaic religion or Christianity or any religion. They count themselves completely secular and uh, separate from any belief or following of God or, or any kind of religious observation of any kind. Um, they're not in the synagogues, friends. And those who do count themselves religious, for now, are continuing to reject Jesus as the true Messiah. Jerusalem is not a friendly place toward the gospel. The idea of a living Christ. Now, they have capitalized on it in regards to tourism. And so my guide, who was one of those secular Jewish Israelites, he doesn't count himself a religious person at all, doesn't believe in a living, personal God. Um, so he does not follow nor believe that the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are, is real. Um, you know, he shared with, with us that, uh, that indeed, um, you know, he would share with us many details of the life of Christ and the ministry of Christ, but he didn't really believe any of it. And, uh, and I had personal conversations with him over that. Great guy, by the way. I just really enjoy. He was an outstanding guide. Um, yeah, we were really blessed. Just a wealth of information. But even though they are capitalizing um, on the tourism aspect of Jesus, the idea of a living Christ, of him being the true Jewish Messiah, is still rejected today. Freedom to evangelize and proselytize uh, Israelites, Jewish Israelites in Israel today, is not accepted. You will find yourself apprehended very quickly by authorities if you start handing out handbills or starting to preach on the street corner the gospel of Jesus being the Messiah that had come to take away the sin of the world. Uh, religious liberty does not exist there right now. Now, friends, that's not to say that it will not in the future, because I will believe it will. In Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, we find some important theology concerning God's place for the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. I believe that many of the Jewish people in the last generation before Jesus comes, their eyes will be opened. I believe that they will come to see that pure Judaism actually is centered on Christ and Christianity, and, uh, and they will become born-again Christians and, uh, and be part of that last push for the Gospels. So uh, when it says in that psalm, and the title of Monday's lesson, you know, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The only way that peace will ever come to Jerusalem is the same way peace will only come to Sacramento or only come to the United States or only come to Canada or only come to Europe or only come to Paris. The only way that peace will ever come to any place in this pla on this planet is through Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. And, uh, and so, friends, we want to pray for Jerusalem that it also will be a champion one day for the true Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ um, himself. All right. And I also want to take advantage of our last few moments here together to be able to uh, offer our free gift offer again. Some of you have joined us since we opened up our study here today and you missed the free gift offer. Um, if you are one of those people, uh, make sure you take advantage of a free gift offer that we have. It's entitled A Divine Design. And this is a deep dive on much of what we touched on in concern to Zion, the sanctuary, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments, the testimony inside the Ark. All of that's inside this particular free gift offer. So this is a great gift, uh, a deep dive. It's multi-colored, uh, of course, glossy, and uh, most importantly, it's clear Bible truth. And so all you have to do is dial 1-866-788-3966. Again, friends, that's 1-866-788-3966. And ask for offer number 902. And uh, our operators will be happy to be able to get that to you. And, uh, and that's if you live in the United States or Canada. We'll sh mail that to you of actual paper copy. If you live in the United States and uh, you want to get a digital copy downloaded on your phone, you can find that link by just simply dialing the code... Um, SH152. Again, that's in your message box, SH152, and you want to dial that to 40544, and that'll get you the link for the free digital download of the same book. If you're outside the United States and Canada, all you have to do is get on any internet and access that you have and go to the website study.aftv.org front slash SH152 and we'll be able to uh, get you a free digital download on your computer that way as well. And so friends, again, thank you so much for joining us and uh, I wanna invite you to join me as we pray. Father God, we wanna thank you so much for the message that you brought to us in the, in the lesson study. We thank you for the Psalms. We thank you for Zion. 
and all that it represents. And pray, God, that you will help us to focus on the heavenly Zion that you have called us to focus on, the bigger and the best Zion that we can find. In Jesus' name we pray these things, God. Amen. Don't forget to request today's life-changing free resource. Not only can you receive this free gift in the mail, you can download a digital copy straight to your computer or mobile device. To get your digital copy of today's free gift, simply text the keyword on your screen to 40544 or visit the web address shown on your screen. And be sure to select the digital download option on the request page. It's now easier than ever for you to study God's Word with amazing facts wherever and whenever you want. And most important, to share it with others.